Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate the introduction and also uh, you commenting on your age at 84. And I have to say, knowing the, the enterprises that you're involved in and the work that you do here at St. Barnabas for the community, uh, I hope I have your energy when I'm your age. It's pretty phenomenal, and I mean that as a, as a sincere compliment. I, uh, <clears throat> I listened to the speakers this morning, and I was very impressed with the subjects of hacking, hacking and cybersecurity, and hacking into computers, hacking into data, hacking into systems and programs, which really are the lifeline, the substance of any business. We can't live in our business in medicine without, without the data that we have. So it's extremely important to protect that data. And when Mr. Day, the president of St. Barnabas, who organized this phenomenal conference, asked me to speak, I said, you know, I'm not a cybersecurity expert by any means. What would you like me to talk about? And he said, well, you know, we're talking about protecting valuable structures and databases. Maybe you can talk about protecting what's the most valuable possession that we all have, our bodies and our minds. And uh, I said, well, I've got a little bit of experience with that. And along with the business analogy, any CEO that I've ever spoken with will always remember the adversity, not so much their successes, but the adversity. How do you overcome adversity? No one, I would venture to say in this room, who has a business has not had to go substa through substantial adversity and overcome that. So the question is, how do you deal with adversity? Jeff Bost, who's my partner and uh, co-director here, attended a symposium in Los Angeles two weeks ago, and the title of the symposium was How to Thrive under adversity. And attending were Navy SEALs, Special Ops Forces, sports psychologists, with the whole emphasis of the meeting being on exactly that topic. How do you overcome adversity? And in this particular group, you know, I'm sure I could ask each one of you the most significant factor that led to your success and it was overcoming adversity, and, and the, the Nietzsche aphorism, that which does not kill me, makes me stronger. And, and it's business, it's in your health, it's in cybersecurity, it's, it's in whatever uh, enterprise it is. So what I'm going to do is share with you uh, a few slides on adversity, overcoming adversity, and then I'm going to give you a formula guaranteed to balance your life. And I've used this with thousands of individuals, including myself, how to lead a balanced life, how to attain work-life balance. Burnout is a subject very common nowadays, not only in business, but also in physicians. 56% of neurosurgeons, what I do, are said to have one symptom, at least, of burnout. 25% of business executives are overwhelmed by too much data, by not enough time for work-life balance, by not enough time for exercise, and have depression and, and suicide at a very high rate uh, in this country. So what I'm going to do is share with you uh, a couple stories. Jim was kind enough to mention the, uh, the triathlons that I've participated in for 30 years now. And uh, this is, you may have heard of the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon. And in 1977, a group of athletes had an awards banquet in Honolulu. There were runners who did the Honolulu uh, Marathon, the bikeless, the cyclists who did the around Oahu 112 mile bike race, and there were swimmers, those who did the Waikiki Rough Water Swim. 
And they were, as men would tend to do, have a few beers, and they got into a, a heated argument. Who's the best athlete? The runner, the biker, the swimmer? And uh, John Collins, a naval commander at that time, had done some mini triathlons in Mission Bay uh, over in California. And he says, why don't we settle it once for all and have a race in which we do all three events the same day, and whoever finishes will be called an Ironman. So this is the first Ironman in 1978. 15 swimmers dove into the water. Uh, 11 finished, won the winner in 11 hours. And uh, subsequently, the race was moved to the big island of Kona, uh, the big island of Hawaii in the city of Kona. And this is, uh, this is the, uh, the swim, 2.4 miles swim, a 112-mile bike up the, uh, the volcano at Javi at the end of the island, and then a 26-mile run through the lava fields of uh, the big island. Uh, this is Heinz Ward and I. Uh, who did this three years ago. And uh, Heinz had never done this race before. I had done it several times, so at least I knew what it was about. He was paid $500,000 by chocolate milk to do the race. They gave me a bottle of chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Heinz, I'd, I'd worked with Heinz with the Steelers through his whole career, and uh, we knew each other very well. And uh, the, the Steelers individual, the Steelers personnel knew we were going to do this race together. And I went up to Heinz beforehand, and I said, Heinz, you know, we're friends, but I just want you to know I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> And he was intimidated because he didn't know what it was. But he did beat me. And uh, not by much, but this is Heinz back here and this is me over here. This is the swim start to give you some idea of, of what it's like. It's an incredible experience. It's 7 a.m. in the morning, a cannon goes off, and you start out on a 140 mile race. And uh, was a fortunate, able to finish. My last one was 16 hours several years ago. It was uh, 13. But so the question is, that's, that's very nice. And uh, what I want to get to, though, is a little bit about adversity. Uh, so this is, you know, what, what stimulates somebody, as Jim said, to be a fitness nut? And I don't look at myself as that. I look at very normal what I do. But, uh, and you'll understand why as I go along and you, and you get the message. So what motivates, in my case, I'm, this is gonna be a very personal talk. So I'm gonna share with you some personal information. And uh, when I first came to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, I, it was fantastic. I was appointed chief at Presby of neurosurgery, named the Steelers consultant, uh, and uh, introduced lasers into neurosurgery with Bob Selker. Uh, did all sorts of great things, performed so-called miracle surgery in terms of exsanguinating patients of all of their blood, filling them with ice water, clipping an aneurysm, and putting the blood back. Very, very heady stuff, heady stuff. And uh, I was flying very high, papers, publishing, traveling, running all over the world. Uh, and then a train wreck. And we're going to discuss adversity and what happened. Uh, a marriage broke up. Uh, my father died suddenly of a heart attack. And I had to quit neurosurgery. I had to leave my job because I had no reserve to operate anymore if there were any problems in surgery. And I was operating on a patient uh, when this all happened. And you know, usually if there's a ble some bleeding or something comes up, you have to be able to jump into your reserve tank. I had no reserve. And I recognized it. And someone helped me close the case. And I, I subsequently said, I can't do this. I have to leave neurosurgery after 20 years of training and everything that went into it. And uh, my father had a truck stop, Dallas Pike truck stop. If you drive down to Wheeling, uh, Dallas Pike exit, an old dilapidated truck stop that was heavily mortgaged. And uh, I moved in with my mother, the true Oedipus complex. The father dies, the son moves in with the mother, lived in an old farmhouse up on the hill above the truck stop. 
ended up filling up 18 wheelers, flipping hamburgers, and working in a truck stop. So one day I was doing miracle brain surgery. The next I'm working in a truck stop, filling up and wondering what is happening here? What's going on? You know, in terms of adversity, uh, your whole being is wrapped up, all of us, in what we do. And my being, my essence, myself, was in what I did. Now I had nothing. I had no family, I had no, no work, no job, nothing. And so the question is, what do you do in a situation like this? And I was, I, I, I was totally lost. And one day the banker who held the mortgage on the truck stop called me and said, Joe, let's go for a run. I said, run, I can't walk, I'm 15 pounds overweight, I can't breathe walking up steps, I, I can't run. And I think he just wanted to make sure I could pay off the mortgage on the truck stop. Uh, so uh, I said, okay, I found an old pair of sneakers and some workout clothes and went down to this track in Tridelphia, West Virginia. And we made it around the track four times, I think it took me a half an hour. And uh, I said, that's it, never again, I don't need any more working out. I'm finished. That night, though, was the first night I slept in about four months. So the next day, I went back myself, and I went around two t or five times, and then six times, and then seven times. And pretty soon, I was sleeping better. I started to lose weight. I started to, my brain got re-engaged. The depression started to lift. So all these things happened totally unintended, unexpected, but that's what happened. So I, I got tired of running, so I bought a bike, and I cross-trained, and then I learned to swim. And then uh, I subsequently did a small mini triathlon. And at that time, if somebody asked me, I would do an Ironman distance race. Absolutely insane, never, no way could I ever do that. And subsequently, I was very fortunate to do eight of them. Um, and I, uh, last, last uh, two months ago, I finished actually first in my age group uh, in a uh, distance race in Muncie, Indiana. Now, what you're not supposed to ask is how many were in my age group. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was me and Jim. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so the bottom line, what I want to get to is what are the lessons learned under this kind of adversity. So what's lesson number one? <clears throat> lesson number one is the tachometer. And what do I mean by that? I had absolutely no insight into what happened to me, zero. I was working, filling up 18 wheelers and wondering how did this happen? How did I get here? I had no insight into burnout. I had no insight into, I had disregarded many things in terms of my family, my kids, and many other areas because of my profession, because of the ego gratification that I derived and oblivious virtually to most other important things in my life, including my physical life. And, you know, burnout, as I, as I mentioned last year, a study from the Mayo Clinic, 50% of doctors show symptoms of burnout. And with the electronic medical records, with Obamacare, with the kind of stresses now physicians, your doctors are under in their office to process patients, to process papers, uh, it's, it's very high, as you can see. And what about executive function overload, which are things that some of you in this room may be confronted with? Drowning in data, management becomes unable to think clearly, uh, emotionally become a bit more labile, a little bit more touching uh, about how you feel, the stimulus that provoke anger or, uh, or lashing out. These are all factors that, again, you must have insight into it. And uh, in terms of the neurobiology of resilience, we're talking about each of you in this room are successful individuals. You're resilient. You can face adversity and come back. That's called resilience. And how do you get resilience? And we're going to talk about a little bit about stress inoculation, 
genetics is a big portent, epigenetics, and, and then active coping. And this is a whole nother lecture that we won't get into, except lesson number two is that of hermesis. Uh, many of you may have may be familiar with the uh, the uh, myth, mytholo it's not mythological Milo of Croton. Milo was a the greatest wrestler 2,500 years ago in in Italy, and when he was very young, he wanted to get strong, so he picked up a calf, and each day he went back and picked up this same calf for the, for the next 10 years. And by the time the calf was a bull, he was carrying the bull around on his shoulders. This is progressive stress. This is hormesis. This is getting stronger with, with resistance and stimulus. And a, a curve that shows this is what we showed to the Navy SEALs a couple of weeks ago about stress inoculation. How do these guys, sons and daughters of people in this room perhaps, go into a training, the most rigorous training in the world, and get stronger and stronger and stronger to be able to do what they do. And the stories that we've been told of where they're going and what they're doing and how they do it, and they're sworn to secrecy, uh, it's stress inoculation. And in business, in your personal life, uh, it, it, it's all about how to handle, how to get stronger. And all of these in the brain play in together. The endocrinology, your hormones, your, the anxiety, depression, your immunologic system. When I was living on that farmhouse, my immunologic system was so, so suppressed, I developed hepatitis, infectious hepatitis from the truck stop food. So I was terribly depressed. I had no immune system, which is what happens with depression. And the stress is what leads to all of these things. So there's an inflection curve in business. There's an inflection curve in your personal life. Maybe by listening to what I'm sharing with you, there's an inflection curve now. You can either stay on your same path and go down, or you can increase and, and maybe do a few things differently that I'm going to share with you. So what did I serendipitously come upon by running around that high school track? What happened? What was happening in my brain? What happens when you walk 10,000 steps a day? You don't have to do triathlons. What happens when you do some resistance exercises or some stretching exercises? Well, what happens is there's a molecule in your brain called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's a growth factor. It's called the miracle grow of the brain. It literally makes new brain cells. What does stress do? Stress kills brain cells. It kills cells in the hippocampus, which is that part of the brain and the temporal lobe that subserves memory. People under chronic stress lose memory. They can't remember because they're killed by the cortisol that's being over-secreted and overproduced. So I was making new brain cells. And the other thing that BDNF does, it makes new connections the synapses that connect brain cells, wherein memory and processing is stored, were depleted. They get killed too with stress. So I was making new synapses and I was developing brain plasticity. Brain plasticity is what Jim reminds me of every time I hear him speak. And also Mr. Day. They have incredible ability to pull an immense amount of data and information together and then like a laser beam, focus it uh, on the appropriate subject, neuroplasticity. In addition, your various serotonin, what's the most common drugs taken in the United States, particularly in women 40 and older today? Antidepressants, SSRIs that are effective in 50% of people and have terrible side effects in others. What's the most effective antidepressant in the world shown by various studies? Physi physical exercise. It increases your serotonin. SSRIs are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It increases serotonin. You take a pill, you pay a lot of money for it, you lose your libido, you become lethargic, you're drowsy. With exercise, you increase your serotonin naturally. 
and the same with acetylcholine. What happens in Alzheimer's? You get depleted of acetylcholine. What is the one thing that does show to help prevent dementia? Is exercise and dopamine, the feel-good hormone. Uh, so what happens with, with exercise, we talked about hormesis, hormesis, we talked about exercise and what it does to the brain. Uh, another subject that's an entire different lecture is when my father died at age 60, I thought that it was all over for me when I hit 60. I'm now 76. And I thought that if I lived past 60, I beat the odds. But that's not so. 70% of what we do is due to our lifestyle. 30% is gene genetically determined. And this is the whole new science of epigenetics, above the genes, those factors that tell your genes what to do. So that uh, when we're talking about epigenetics and gene activation, what are the most potent epigenetic factors? Well, it's your diet, your exercise, environmental factors, and stress. All of these factors liberate transcription factors, which are chemicals that tell the genes what proteins to make. You have 23,000 or so genes, or uh, gene, yes, and you have, those genes make up to 100,000 different proteins. What happens if you eat a Big Mac from meat infused with antibiotics and, uh, and hormones fed in a feedlot and then wash it down with phosphoric acid in your Coca-Cola uh, and uh, deplete your bones of calcium and then put a little side order of trans fatty acids on there with your french fries. <laughs> well, what happens is those are telling through the transcription factors that they release, they tell your genes to make inflammatory agents, inflammatory cytokines. What is the common cause? This is a 25-point bonus question. What's the most common cause of cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, and arthritis? Stress. Inflammation. Inflammation. So we want an anti-inflammatory diet. And we want to work out for reasons I said, and we want to avoid as much as possible the air pollution, the pesticides, the garbage that is sprayed on our food, and also reduce emotional stress as best as we can. Uh, and, and that's a whole, a whole nother way. So uh, a, a low calorie, low carbohydrate, Mediterranean diet, the exercise, and then with the emotional health, how do you reduce stress? Another, another lecture, the people who live the longest, the most centenarians in this world are in areas uh, like, uh, in areas in Greece, areas in Costa Rica, uh, where they have fa strong family units, they're religious or at least spiritual, or they meditate, but they have closeness and a spirituality that they use to reduce stress, which is, which is critical. So getting back to summing up, I, I've given you a lot of information. I'm happy to expound on that if you want afterwards. But Aristotle, 384, said the golden mean is hitting the mean between extremes in everything, whether it's diet, whether it's work, whether it's exercise, hit the mean between extremes. And when I was on the, in that farmhouse, I, uh, I again serendipitously picked up a book that was given to me in high school as a graduation prize uh, by William Danforth, the founder of the William Danforth Foundation, and also the Ralston Purina Company, this checkerboard square company. And he gave this book, I Dare You, to graduating seniors across the country. And I read it and put it down and really didn't pay much attention to it. But I picked it up when I was in that farmhouse and I read it again. And he said, this book is for the daring few who are headed somewhere. At that time, I didn't know where I was going. Those afraid to dare might as well pass it up. It will weary the lazy because it calls for immediate action. 
you can be a bigger person, and I'm going to prove it to you. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do right now to you. I'm going to give you a formula, a secret, so to speak. It's not a secret on how to balance your life, how to attain work-life balance. And what you need to do is draw a square. Very simple. Just like you see here. And on this square, I want you to think in your minds how much time you put on work, how much time you spend on your family and your social commitments, how much time you spend spiritually, whether it's church, synagogue, meditation, connecting with the higher being, whatever it's spirituality means to you, and how much time do you spend on the physical side of your square? Draw it right now in your minds. Think about it. You know, what would your square, would it be a perfect square? Very few people's probably are. But this is what my square looked like. When I drew my square in that farmhouse, work was a straight line. There was virtually no family social. Spirituality was non-existent. And I did nothing physical except walk to get in my car. And it, I, maroon axiom number one is you can get by with one of these atrophic. If two are atrophic, you're seeing your minister, your psychiatrist, your psychologist, uh, your rabbi, or whomever, but you're not healthy. And uh, it may look like this, so it tells you what you need to do. And again, you don't have to do triathlons. You need to work out 30 minutes a day, work out, walk 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and it will reduce the incidence of diabetes by 45% just doing that. What's the most common cause of blindness, the most common cause of kidney transplantation and amputation of limbs? Diabetes. Why can't people walk 30 minutes a day if you're going to prevent these kinds of disastrous complications? So uh, we put together basically what I'm telling you here in a book that's going to be published uh, next month, actually, entitled Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life. And uh, these same concepts, I, I gave this talk initially, believe it or not, in 1986. I was president of the Congress of Neurological Surgery, and I had to give a presidential address. I've given hundreds of talks since then. No one ever remembers anything I've ever said in any of those other talks except the concept of the square and how to balance your life. So it's a simple thing. and. Every day, I showed the tachometer. When I get in my car, every day to drive, to work, or wherever I'm going, I look at my tachometer because I want to rev up my engine, but I want to stay out of the red zone. I was in the red zone for a couple of years and didn't know it until the engine burned up. So every day, I look at my tachometer and say, when am I, when am I going to get my 30 minutes or an hour in of work? exercise. When am I going to call my kids? What am I going to do spiritually in terms of interacting with my patients? Uh, and, and that side of things that I'm very blessed uh, in what I do to do that. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.